Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series on the book of Luke. It's an exciting series, at least I think so. And it's a series that we'll, cover, we'll be covering in the, books of, in the months of April, May, and June of 2015. It's entitled, this particular lesson is lesson number 11, entitled The Kingdom of God, and it's the lesson for June 13 of 2015. I hope you have your Bible handy. We're going to be looking a lot at um, Luke, scattered passages in Luke, actually, mostly 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, somewhere in there. And we're going to talk about what Jesus was talking about to those people on the other side of the Jordan. But before we do that, let's ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. <clears throat> Our kind and wonderful Father, it's always a great privilege to pray to you, to think about you, to try to follow your teachings in Scripture. And now as we open once again the book of Luke, may we comprehend and present well, to, be to the best of our ability, the ideas that you want us to get from these passages is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus spent quite a lot of time in his ministry talking about the kingdom of God. That was at least partly because the kingdom that he had in mind was so different from the kingdom that the people in Judea and Galilee in those days were thinking about. So let's start with that. What was their idea of what was coming in terms of a kingdom of God? Greatness. The here and now and Rome out of the picture. Mm -hmm. That their nation would be preeminent on the planet mm -hmm. and uh, all that goes with that. Kind of like the days of Solomon and David. Yeah. Yeah, if we could just be like David again. Jesus, we know you can do it. Why, why is it taking you so long? Just step up to the plate and do what you need to do. I like I like what you said, Gordon. It paints a picture of in those days, um, they may not have been the most preeminent thing, but they were secure. They didn't have to worry about their enemies coming down and pestering them and marauding herds and, 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 and so on and so forth. Not necessarily that there was this great outreach mm -hmm. in the time of David or Saul, but... Um, they were, uh, they were safe. Yes. Physically safe. They were concerned about me, myself, and I. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I quote from the Ministry of Healing, page 36, paragraph 2, the kingdom of God comes not with outward show. Oh boy, that leaves a lot of people out, doesn't it? It comes through the gentleness of the inspiration of His Word, through the inward working of His Spirit, the fellowship of the soul with Him, who is its life. The greatest manifestation of its power is seen in human nature brought to the perfection of the character of Christ. What does that mean? Could the Holy Spirit actually transform us to become like Jesus Christ? That's what our job is if we're willing. There's is it our job to do that or is it our job to let the Holy Spirit do that for us? But it can, is the Holy Spirit going to overpower our freedom to choose? No. So if we, we have to, <laughs> Gary mentioned diligence, we have to do some study. In fact, Jesus told us what eternal life was, to know the Father and the Son. Yeah. So uh, because there's no substitute. getting to know them, we should get to love them, and as we spend time thinking about them, it changes us. And God is love. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what kind of kingdom was... Jesus talking about, by contrast. We're not sure? A kingdom like heaven. Well, Jesus is talking about a kingdom where the king not only serves the citizens, but dies for them. I mean, what kind of a kingdom is that? Someplace says we're supposed to be a kingdom of kings and priests. Yes, yes. So, and everybody's supposed to be a, a part of that. It's all in Exodus 6, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, Exodus 19, 
verses 6 to 8 in there, and again in 1 Peter. And so who'd want to be a king if, if you got a, no, no, no servants to sweep your floor and tidy Boy. up for you? Everybody. There's no pecking order there, is it? It seems to me in some ways we've got to get to heaven to find that out because if it's a perfect world we're going to be living in, and you say, what, are you gonna, what is there to do? You know what? I, I, it's like yeah. there's a whole realm there I don't think we fully will understand. No, we haven't we get begun. There. I think we're going to be challenged. God is going to ask us to be witnesses to the rest of the universe. We're going to be going here and there saying, you know, we were, the, we were the sore thumb of the universe, and this is what happened, and this is what the results were, and this is why I'm so thankful I'm here. This is the kind of transform, transform life that can happen to people who get to know Jesus. And they're saying, oh, okay. First Corinthians 4, 9, though. Yeah. This is to answer those questions that the two-thirds of the angels had yeah. in heaven when Lucifer, or Satan, left heaven. Mm -hmm. So uh, this earth is the answer to that. Uh, if yeah. we don't have that as part of the paradigm, we're losing out. God's plan is to have a kingdom that's worldwide, in which all are treated completely equally and fairly with no class, gender, racial, or income distinctions. Can you imagine that kind of a kingdom? Jesus will be the king himself. His kingdom will never end. No income distinctions. Distinctions? No. Why, why did you put no, that in? Why do you think I put that in? Because some people do get blessed more than others on th some things. We're some people, blessed some by people God or get blessed by Satan. Well, there's people that have different talents. They have different abilities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if everybody was the same, you wouldn't have to help each other anymore. And then what would be the point? You know, heaven doesn't seem to be structured like that. What do you mean? We have God, and then we have these different layers of angels that mm -hmm. do different things, so... And their greatest delight is to do His will. Well, that might be true, but there's still different caste-type things, no. levels, well, when, and... When it's, just that, this, it's just that one isn't up above the other, no. you know? That's, that's the thing. Everybody is important. Even it Jesus, is. in John 15, he says, I call you, no longer call you slaves, slaves or servants, I call you friends. Friends is a horizontal relationship. Yeah. You don't have a, cut, a peck and order at the table here. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're a rocket scientist or a, or a maid, you know, it's, you're still friends with God. Um, the imagine, friendship is still yeah. valued. Imagine the, the most powerful angel, Gabriel, in heaven, is sent down here to speak to a teenage girl, a girl, imagine, a woman, in that time in history was considered to be the lowest, okay? And he says to her, you are going to have a special relationship with the Holy Spirit, and you're going to have a child, and he's to be called the Son of the Highest. It'd be also what, called what? Uh, Almighty, or Mighty God. Mighty Prince God, Everlasting Peace. Father, Everlasting Prince of Peace. Father, yeah. Yeah. By his life and death, he would forever prove the falseness of all of Satan's claims and ultimately bring an end to Satan's challenge that started right there next to the throne of God in heaven. Here God is the Most High, yet he, he'll live in our world as the lowest person. That's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah. Yep. Christ risked everything to win this battle. In the end, he will establish his kingdom here on planet Earth where the battle was won. You've heard me say probably before that Satan wishes that God would just abandon this Earth to him. Satan would be happy for God to have the whole rest of the universe. Just, just leave this little Earth to me, Satan says. Delusional. Delusional. I mean, he doesn't understand that the source of life is dependent upon the, the yeah. Creator. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and he what? What? How? Do, or you you think just he doesn't understand. Well, or you think he doesn't understand? Just to, in answer to the way that description that Ken was given. The uh, interesting, yeah, was, the interesting, of course, is that God responds by saying, I, "Not only am I not going to do what you want, I'm going to make this earth my future headquarters." Yeah, yeah. And he uh, wasn't doing to uh, having a, a battle with with Satan. It was for the benefit of the onlooking universe. 
Well, through the power of the Holy Spirit in this new kingdom, Jesus offers the opportunity for human beings to be transformed to become members of his winning team. So what do the citizens of this new kingdom of God look like? Remember reading any verses in the Bible? <coughs> well, look, let's, let's pick out a couple. Look at uh, Luke 12, 31 to 33. Instead, be concerned with his kingdom, and he will provide you with these things. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Set all, or sell all your belongings and give the money to the poor. Provide for yourselves purses that don't wear out, and save the rich, your riches in heaven, where they will never decrease, because no thief can um, get to them, and no moth can destroy them. You probably have heard on the news just recently that a group, a small group of people figured out how to get into a bank vault through an air vent, I think it is, or something like that, and took, carried off millions and millions of dollars worth of diamonds. There is nothing secure on this earth. There, I mean, they, they didn't even bother to check on this until two, three days later, because there's no way anybody would get in there and get those things, right? they're gone. What should we learn from that? Look at this. Look at Luke 9, 59 to 62. But he said to another man, follow me. But that man said, sir, first let me go back and bury my father. Jesus answered, let the dead bury their dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Doesn't that sound kind of disrespectful? I mean, aren't you supposed to take, you know, at least enough respect to bury your father? What's he trying to tell us? Get your priorities sorted out. Well, but you need to understand Jewish customs a little bit. Yeah. When a father, when, it, when someone dies in Jewish custom, how long does it take to bury him? 24 hours. It's, it's supposed to happen within 24 hours. 24 hours. So this guy is not talking about his dead father, and, and they haven't got him buried yet. He's saying, I have no idea when my father's going to die. It could be years from now. But I have to wait because I might have to bury him. I don't know. Maybe he'll die tomorrow. And Jesus says, you can't wait for that. Get out there and preach the kingdom of God. So someone else follow, followed Jesus and said, I will follow you, sir, but first let me go and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus said to him, anyone who starts to plow and then keeps looking back is of no use to the kingdom of God. <coughs> well... Citizens of this new kingdom will exhibit childlike trust. It will not be the domain of the rich. No matter how much we have to give up, even home, father, mother, or children, it will be worth it. Everything we have should be invested in this new kingdom. Like Jesus, we are to assist the poor and the downtrodden. By helping them, we are demonstrating that we understand the principles of this new kingdom. But being a citizen of this new kingdom requires a total commitment. Once you understand something of what it is all about, we will never allow earthly matters to distract us and turn us back from our commitment. So you're going to say, how many Christians are there walking around that are behaving like that? Can you tell me what you mean by childlike trust? Unless we exhibit childlike trust, we're... Well, I mean, that's a good question. I hope it doesn't mean childlike gullibility. Yes. Can't mean that. So it, it, it's talking about, and children, we know, small children will basically, if, if parents or uh, assuming they're reasonably normal parents or grandparents say, please do this, the child would do it. You could set him up on a table and say, jump to grandpa, and they will, you know, they'll probably jump. It's a natural instinct to trust your, mm -hmm. to trust your parents. I've, yeah. I've known some parents that were not really in my estimation, uh, um, very trustworthy parents, but uh, the student, uh, the kids would, um, they'd have to get pretty old before they didn't, uh, before they realized they couldn't trust their parent. Yeah. Well, look at these startling verses in Luke 18, 29 to 30. I assure you that anyone who leaves home, 
or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will receive much more in this present age and eternal life in the age to come. What in the world is he talking about? I'm sure he doesn't mean if you leave one wife now you can have two more next. <laughs> but what does he mean? It, he can't mean abandoning all our earthly responsibilities. He's talking about being kingdoms, citizens of this new kingdom by following him and making this our top priority. How, how would that be manifest in the 21st century? I mean, how would you contrast sure. it? Well, how, I mean, if, do you know anybody that lives like that? Tell us about them. Wouldn't some of this apply to some of these poor people we see on the news every other night that just get grabbed and snuffed out, to put yeah. it bluntly? There's got to be something in what happens to them that plays out in here in the end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, look at a couple of examples that Jesus talked about. One is in Luke 4, 16 to 21. This is a familiar passage. And Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath he went up as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him. As he said to them, this passage of scripture has come true today as you heard it being read. Now some of you will remember what we studied a number of lessons ago. Remember what the context was here? The head of the synagogue had stood up and exclaimed about how the Messiah was coming and he was going to help them lead the army against the Romans and they were going to drive the Romans out. He had explained the whole usual thing that the Jews believed. And when he was all done, Jesus stood up and said this. And a few of them realized that he was actually talking about himself. And then they wanted to kill him. Yep. Rock the boat. That's not what we wanted to hear, right? <laughs> You're the kid from down the street. You, you used to make our chairs and our tables. How can you possibly claim to be the Messiah? Right? Well, look at Luke 17, verse 21. It's another verse. And there's some strange stories about his father, too. Yeah. No one will say, look, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you, or it could be the kingdom of God is among you. What was Jesus talking about? Was there a king among them in their midst? He was the king. That's right. He was the king that was in their midst, right? God's power was manifest through the healing of the sick, the preaching of the gospel, the forgiving of sins, and the ultimate triumph of good over evil. And there's something we overlook. We talked a little bit about this a couple of weeks ago, but there's something that's overlooked. If you read carefully, especially in the Gospel of Luke, there's one place where it says he started healing people and the news of his healing power spread through the entire country of Syria. What do you suppose when all the people in, happened when the, all the people in Syria heard that there was someone down in Israel that was healing people? How far is Syria? Next door. Next door yeah. But it's quite a way. I mean, it's miles and miles. Mm -hmm. 150 miles to at least to the, to the capital of Syria. They started moving down to find him. And there's other places where it says people were in the crowd from Tyre and Sidon, from Perea, from uh, Cappado not Cappadocia, from um, Syria. It just mentions all. And why do you suppose men Luke mentions those things and the other gospel writers don't? Because it was people from all over beside the Jews. Mm -hmm. Luke, the non-Jew, is going to mention them. Yep. Well, he's also a physician who's interested yeah. in healing. Mm -hmm. Did Luke show up at that time? No. Luke? 
Luke didn't know anything about the gospel until years later when Paul passed, came to Troas. Well, <clears throat> what about the kingdom of God today? Think you could point it out? Well, Ellen White once said these words, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 108, paragraph 1. The kingdom of God's grace is now being established as day-by-day day hearts that have been full of sin and rebellion yield to the sovereignty of his love. Well, won't God's kingdom be made up of, of um, people and others who um, ally themselves with him? Mm -hmm. And when a person is, um, makes the decision to follow God, mm -hmm. Doesn't his eternal life begin then? Yeah. When I make my commitment to the Lord, mm -hmm. my eternal life begins then. Now, there may be some stuff in between. Uh, the time my life has begun, begun to be an eternal life and the time I get to heaven. Yeah. But nevertheless, when I make that commitment, my eternal life has begun then. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case, then I am a member of God's kingdom, and yes. therefore God's kingdom would have to be in certain applications. It would have to be here and now. Does that make some yeah. sense? So Some what, sense. Yes. <laughs> Not a complete What's, sense. So <laughs> you're, you're starting to talk about the kingdom of glory as opposed to the kingdom of grace. What do we know about the kingdom of glory? I thought I was talking about it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so Ellen White goes on in that same passage. She says, the full establishment of the kingdom of his glory will not take place until the second coming of Christ to this world. I'm sure you would agree with that. Well, I'm certainly not going to contradict her. <laughs> <laughs> well, not if... Here the, on good open answer. TV, anyway. Yeah, good answer. <laughs> well, if the kingdom of God has already been established, as suggested by Jesus in a number of places... Why do we see much, so much trouble in our world? Shouldn't, shouldn't the establishment of the kingdom of God wipe out all trouble? Well, the kingdom of God existed uh, before the earth existed. Okay. And there was trouble there. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's the same phenomenon. When Paul went out, he caused all kinds of trouble. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really him doing it. It was the other people that were trying to get him to get him in trouble. But um, it seemed like trouble followed everywhere he went. Same thing could be said of Jesus. And it almost looks like he got beheaded because of the trouble he made, not because of his, his faith. So now what's this got to he's, do with I'm still here. the kingdom here? Well, well it, the he's been asking the question, you know, what, what happens when the kingdom comes? Well, Paul was going around preaching the kingdom and nothing but trouble was coming out of it. Yeah. Well, has God lost control? No. You know, there's plenty of people in our world today that would say God doesn't even exist. No, it sounds like there's, there's something fighting it. I mean, that's, that's obviously what it is, isn't it? Isn't something yeah. following along with it, fighting it? That's well, causing all kinds you know of that in Mark 13 and Luke 21, Matthew 24 and 25, there's a lot of talk about what's going to happen at the end of this earth's history. And it's a lot of trouble. So we shouldn't be surprised if we see trouble coming. It's, the fact that there's trouble is, is, is not a proof that God's lost control. It's a proof that he could predict the trouble before it happened. When you use the term kingdom of glory, are you talking about the kingdom... Uh, um, uh, um, the the environment when there is no sin. Well, yeah, when, when, God is, when Jesus is king once again, and all, all, right. all death evil and, and sin and right. evil have been wiped out, yeah. Right. Well, what are, are there certain certainties that we are given about the kingdom of God? God will be there. Yeah, sure, okay, good. We're, we're told, and this is very interesting, think about it for a moment. Jesus came and went through this incredible 
experience, finally dying on a cross, and he basically hands over the responsibility of spreading the gospel to a bunch of disheartened, discouraged people who aren't even quite sure what, what, what they're supposed to be doing. I mean, what, doesn't that seem like an incredibly risky thing to do? Did he have a choice <laughs> or somebody else? Was, was I was there, afraid you, someone was going to ask that question. Was there risk involved? What do you think? Sounds like it to me. So why um, didn't he use the angels? So, so you're saying there was a risk that failure could, could have occurred. Mm -hmm. Satan, I can just tell you, I mean, I, I mean, this is not news to any of you, I'm sure. Satan would have loved to just wipe out everybody in the upper room. One fell swoop. All, all finished, done. Gordon, I think I interrupted your question. What, what was your question again? Well, why not use, if humans yeah. are so bad, why not use angels? They didn't have no, it. good and relate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if we don't have time to do it now, but if we were to read Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, uh, Ephesians 3, 7 to 10, and Colossians 1, 19 to 20, it says there the God, the infinite God of the universe, intends to teach us the truth about God through the use of his church here on planet Earth. How does that work? Well, in our lesson, it says God through his church has established a plan to save humanity from sin. And two, ultimately, God plans to come to this earth to live in peace, harmony, and happiness with his family. And of course, that's Revelation 21. You know, Gordon, in, in response to your question, as I was thinking here, <clears throat> I think one reason is that we're the ones that have created the mess. We're the ones who created the mess. Well, <laughs> we perpetuated it. Actually, don't you have uh, to kind of... I can't, I'm not sure <clears throat> we can blame, him, blame it on the devil. <clears throat> but anyway, not our part. Um, now you distracted me. I'm trying to think of where I was going with this. <laughs> um, so we're, we're the ones that have, have created, uh, at least as far as we're concerned, this little planet is concerned, this doubt that um, that we can live in harmony with God's universe. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, it's up to us. It, it ha it's a natural consequence of us to, uh, up to us to prove that it can, that we can. It, it would seem that that is well, a component. And, and you've just made a very important point that we sometimes haven't talked about enough. Satan's one claim against God that he still sticks to. He's, almost everything else he's claimed has been disproven. But his one claim he still sticks to is, God, there's no way you can ever get enough of these people to live unselfish, God-committed, loving lives to, to be a group of people that you can call your people. You'll just never get enough of them to, 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 to stick together and be your people. And God says, oh yes, it will happen. And Satan says, ha, I haven't seen it yet. That's what he's doing right now. Do you laughing think, at God. Do you think that angels can relate to men to tell them the truth? They do. Do you think uh, so? Well, they I think I think they can't because they're not human. They need to speak humans need to speak to humans to understand what's going on. But in their ranks they have they have certainly experienced something similar. Yeah, but they weren't human. If the devil and his minion, minions can tempt us, surely God's angels can be I, I just, I just don't buy, buy it. You've got to be human to get this, the message. Well, I'll tell you, there, there were three people walking along a dusty road one time, and they stopped at Abraham's house, and they understood things pretty well. No, they didn't. Uh, yeah, they understood it, but Abraham sure didn't. Well, they told him all kinds of stuff, but Abraham, he went, he, he left them wondering what was going on. Mm -hmm. that's so wow. that's my point. He certainly didn't expect. You've got to have a point where humans can tell humans about the good news. Jesus came, God came down as a human so he could tell them, tell us. There's a reason for that. The reason, angels can't do it. I'll tell you what the reason is. 
We need that experience of telling others. That's why God leaves, it to, leaves us to do it. We need that experience. It's for us. Well, I can't argue with that. It, and the reason is simple. <laughs> the, the reason is simple. Let me just explain that. Anybody who is a teacher, Diane, I'll ask you. Anybody who's a teacher knows that you have to go over your subject and over it again, and still the first time you get up to teach it, you're going to be inclined to think, wow, but you have do to I know really know that? You what? have to know your audience. Yeah. And there's no audience human audience that will know a human audience, but a human. But you're equating, in essence, as I hear you, you're equating the devil's angels on a higher level than God's angels. We've got angels. We've, we've, had, we've got, each of us have got guardian angels who are there to minister to us if we give them the opening. Well, that isn't my point, though. I'm talking about understanding the good news. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about well, guardianship or I, I, who's maybe, powerful maybe we need to or read what they've some done. Verses. Look, look at it. I just mentioned Ephesians 3, 7 to 10. Now, let me read this. I was made a servant of the gospel by God's special gift, which he gave me through the working of his power. I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to, put, to, put it, to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. Mm -hmm. if, now, it's, it's happening here. This is the theater of the universe. But if they can't learn from us, then there's a problem. And it goes on, if you go back and Look at the follow-up verse in Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. So he's saying, okay, the one who came and lived and died was fully God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe. Now, this is the, the human Jesus. Through the human Jesus, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all things both on earth and in heaven. So I have to think that... John 12, 32 and yeah. uh, 1 Peter 1, 12 and yeah. Christ yeah. Corinthians 4, 9. Yeah, lots of places. You, you happen to think what? I have to think that their thinking is not that much different than ours because God has demonstrated once and for all for their benefit and for ours the truth. So he's just making us do it just just to be good it's to us. It's a privilege to us. It's a privilege. It's a part of our learning process. I, I think it's because we are the best ones to do it. That's, well, that's my point. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. The angels can do something, but... Well, in the mad rush of activities here on Earth, one thing must take priority, and that thing is getting ready. There won't be a second chance, those, despite the story of the rich man and Lazarus, we, the time for us to get ready is now. A Acts 1, remember Acts 1, 8 to 1 to 8, and I'm just going to read the last part of it. For 40 days, I'm starting with verse 3, for 40 days after his death, he appeared to them many times in ways that proved beyond doubt that he was alive. They saw him, he talked with them about the kingdom of God, and when they came together, he gave them this order, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift I had told you about, the gift, of my fa the, my, the gift my father promised. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Try to imagine what they thought when he said that. When the apostles met together with Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel? What are they still thinking? Mm -hmm. Somehow or other there's going to be an earthly kingdom involved here, right? Jesus said to them, of course, you know, that, that's the Father's business, not my business. But when the Holy Spirit comes, verse 8, upon you, you will be filled with power and you will be witness to me, witnesses for me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Pretty impressive, pretty incredible, right? That's our job. So crucifixion weekend proved to be a revolutionary transformation for the followers of Jesus. And of course, the the few weeks that followed it. We've already mentioned the fact that Peter 
is denying Jesus with cursing and swearing there in, the, in, in, in Caiaphas' courtyard. And what happened to him a few weeks later? He was standing up before the Sanhedrin, yeah. Yeah. denouncing them as the ones that had killed Jesus. There's a lot of work to do, but Christ promises us that the Holy Spirit, which was and will be poured out in Pentecostal power on those who are willing to become true citizens of the new kingdom of glory, will be with us and guide us. While living in that uncertainty, can we still be faithful citizens of the kingdom? We don't know the time. I'm reading from the Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 8, paragraph 1. Of the poor in spirit, Jesus says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This kingdom is not, as Christ's hearers had hoped, a temporal and earthly dominion. Christ was opening to men the spiritual kingdom of his love, his grace, and his righteousness. The ensign of the Messiah's reign is distinguished by the likeness of the Son of Man. His subjects are the poor in spirit, the meek, the persecuted for righteousness' sake. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. You mentioned the words getting ready. Mm -hmm. Isn't when a person, they give their life to the Lord, isn't, aren't they ready? I hope so. They're in the process of getting ready. Well, what do you have to do to get ready after you've given your life to, to God? Well, I mean, we give our lives to God, and then God says, okay, now I've got a job for you to do. And that's part of the getting ready, too. As we teach others, what happens? We understand it better ourselves. And that's what God wants. Well, but is that, is that getting ready, or what are we getting ready for? Well, Ellen White puts it like this in another place, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 355. We are now in God's workshop. Many of us are rough stones from the quarry. But as we lay hold upon the truth of God, its influence affects us. So, so God still if, needs to work on us. If I give my heart to the Lord and it's my commitment and I die in a car wreck on the way home, I'm not ready? Well, you're ready enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's what matters. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I that makes sense. I like that, but somehow it, <laughs> I don't understand where this getting ready comes. <laughs> well, but, but hold on now. If, uh, let's if just I, say, if for I'm example, not ready, then yeah. Let, hold, if hold, I am let, ready, then let, let me let me use an earthly Johnny letter. over there. He he survived the car rash, and now he's got more getting ready than I to get done. <laughs> <that>. so, <laughs> What's going on here with this getting ready stuff? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you right now. You've got a big job to do. Let's say you're the president of a company, and you've got a product you're trying to get out to the whole world. So you employ someone. You, you investigate them. You say, yes, this is the right person. This person will do a good job for me. So you employ them. Are you employing them to sit now and say, you've been employed by us. You're, you're, you're home free, man. Or do you expect them to do something? Well, but... I think is he an employee? Yeah, he's already an employee. Is I, he being paid? Yeah, he's being paid. Will he do more if you give him more time? Of course. I understand all that. I'm still trying to figure out <laughs> the essentialness of this getting ready stuff. But Isn't there a refinement sure. that goes with that? That's what he, Ellen White's talking about here. We're, and I can be glad that I got killed in the car wreck because I don't well, have to go through all I that refinement. Right. There's another side to it. If God is the one that keeps your next heartbeat and the one after it going, if he decides to let that stop, maybe he can see down the road 25 years, 10 years, that something's coming up that he knows you can't handle. Yeah. Well, then you're not goes ready my, for it. Goes my not no, getting ready. you were, like, he, like, <laughs> like Dr. Hart said, you are ready enough to, to let in the front door when Christ comes back. As we lay hold, let me just, as we lay hold upon the truth of God, its influence affects us. I guess the reason, one reason I asked that question is, I would say, that some would say, that the generation prior to me was very concerned about getting ready. Mm -hmm. And... They did. And some people felt 
up till the end of their lives that they were never ready. Mm. Uh, am, is that making, is that ringing a, a bell at all? Sure, I, I know about people like that. Right. And um, so I guess that question is kind of coming from there a little yeah. bit. Looking well, this it. getting ready elevates us and removes us from every imperfection and sin of whatever nature. Thus we are prepared to see the kingdom is, king and his beauty and finally to unite with the pure and heavenly angels in the kingdom of glory. It is here that this work is to be accomplished for us, here that our bodies and spirits are to be fitted for immortality. Sounds like a job to be done, doesn't it? Now, well, I don't know, maybe we're running out of time. We'll see if we have a little more time. All of this points as Christians forward to the most momentous event that has ever happened on planet Earth. The members of God's family know that the time is coming when they will take their places alongside him in the heavenly kingdom. Physicist Steven Weinberg once commented about our world's history saying, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. And some of his fellow scientists agreed with him, even suggesting that there's no reason for the universe to have any points since it's just a physical system. But Christians know that God has a plan and we need to be a part of it. It's been 170 years since the Great Disappointment. Are we prepared for the Second Coming? Are we helping others to understand the necessary issues and the steps they need to be taking to be prepared for that coming? Is anybody prepared? And if you say yes, are you sure? We need to keep growing. Not my job to judge, fortunately. Well, you're, you're kind of asking to judge to make for that question, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Do people who, who lived and passed, let's say 100 years ago or 200 years ago or even yesterday, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Is there a greater preparation that's going to be required for those end times than it was necessary when those people lived and passed? Yes. I think that, and, and, and I, I think this is well supported, certainly in the writings of Alan White and I think from the Bible, that there's going to be a group who are going to have to, and this is Revelation 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, um, there's a group of people who have to be prepared to stand absolutely firm so they cannot be moved by anything the devil throws at them. And then God will say, okay, now's the time. I can come back again. I can let the devil do his worst and my people will not fail me. How do you get to that point? Practice looking at Jesus, following his example, giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity to work in our lives, and praying. There's only three things that God the asks. The hidden us. subject to that, it says you. Yeah. It's you. You practice. You do this. Mm -hmm. You do that. Yeah. It sounds like it's a behavior thing that we got to no, got to master to for for this to happen. It's behavior in this sense only. We have to give God the opportunity to work in us. If we refuse to let God work in us, we will never make it. And, and okay, another, I go for that. Another perception I, I have is that you have to have a, a, an awareness, a connection, an intimacy, a familiarity with God so that you will be able to tell right from wrong. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's, I think it's, although Adventists believe we have a significant part in, in helping to prepare for that time, it's also part of our understanding that there are going to be people part of that group may never even heard of Seventh-day mm -hmm. Adventists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you, go ahead, George, Gordon. To, to get to know God, we have Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. Yes. Those are the ways we grow, uh, grow to be more like God. Mm -hmm. and That's the way we learn about Him. That's the way our lives can be transformed. And we can't stop. Yeah. Say, I know it. That is the end, you know, we keep studying. We'll be studying for eternity. And there are people in the 
Catholic Church and the Baptist Church, sure. even Islam, sure. who oh, who have the who have the foundations for that, mm -hmm. so that when that time comes, it but will it will fall into place. Here's here's my discussion or my response to people who talk about well. Why should we say anything to these other groups? Because they already, you know, God will, will, will work with them wherever they are. My response is, do you think we're going to learn anything after we get to the kingdom of heaven? We'd be horribly bored if we don't. Absolutely. So why shouldn't we learn as much as we can right now? And that means for, for those of us who have access to this immense wealth of, of good news, I might call it, why shouldn't we be sharing it? I mean, it, this is we're this is the beginning of the process. We're gonna we're gonna be in for the rest of eternity. What's what's the problem? We we we, we don't want to get started. Minimum requirement is a willingness to listen and take yeah. instruction. And Jesus says, I, "Everything I learned from my Father, I've made known unto you." And knowing is a teaching process. When we pray in the Lord's Prayer, "Thy kingdom come," what what are we what are we saying? Bring his kingdom. Part of it. B bring it. Bring okay, it let's, on. <laughs> let's think about some of the things. Let's let's try to look at it very carefully. We need to remember first of all, it's his kingdom, not ours. So the rules for the kingdom are his rules, not ours. Our lives are to be transformed as we become citizens of this kingdom of grace. Okay. And three, experiencing that kingdom of grace right now, we look forward to the kingdom of glory where we shall live forever in the very presence of God. Revelation 11, 15, and 21, 1 to 3. Jesus came to a world which was being overrun by Roman military might. He came to a people who were hoping to overthrow that Roman yoke. They were looking for a glorious kingdom like that of their ancestor David. They were looking to be Romans themselves. Yeah. In the fullness of time, Jesus had come to announce that the first phase of God's kingdom was at hand. There was no uncertainty about his message, but it did not involve conquering the Romans. He came to defeat sin and not Romans. While there has been a 2,000 year delay, God's ultimate victory is guaranteed because of what Jesus did. There's no way he can lose. And what does that victory involve? Most importantly, it involves a victory in the great controversy. All of Satan's false claims have been decidedly refuted. The true nature of sin has been revealed and God is just waiting for his children on this earth to get ready for the kingdom of glory. How do I know that? 2 Peter 3, 10 to 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise the heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed and the earth with everything in it will vanish. That sounds like a pretty horrendous kind of destruction, doesn't it? Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should be you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. How do we get ready for that kind of an experience? It's kind of hard to imagine that kind of experience. Mm, yeah. I mean, it seems like when you look at that literally, you'd be floating in space. Yeah. Well, sometimes using a military experience, um, <clears throat> it is some of the early parts of the battles that prepare you to withstand the tougher parts that you meet eventually. So it's my perception that, I don't know if this is correct or not, but in those end times, part of what's happening at those end times will help to, to um, formulate the characters in those, uh, of those people. Mm -hmm. uh, at the, at the critical mass of those end times. Well, let's look at some passages from Luke especially about what this kingdom of grace is like, because that's what we're in, in now, right? 
The plan provides for the forgiveness of sin, Luke 5, 20 and 21, for the involvement of the ministry of healing. People are going to be healed. That's what salvation means, to be healed. For the caring for the poor and needy, Luke 18, 22. For the ultimate defeat of Satan as the conclusion of the great controversy, Luke 10, 18. Thus the kingdom of God is far from being a myth. It is a dynamic, God-centered, present reality. Luke 10, 9 and 11, 16, 16, 7, 17, 17, 21, Matthew 12, 28, Mark 1, 14. I mean, there's lots of verses. And an eschatological hope of glory. The establishment of God's kingdom results in the destruction of all the hostile powers, the last of which will be death and Satan. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 to 28. We had time. We look at those verses. They're pretty impressive. So those who recognize all that is implied by God's kingdom will not permit any compromise or any distraction to take their eyes away from Jesus, who is the door to the kingdom. <coughs> do we do that? Can we do that? Could we do that in the 21st century? There's no doubt about, or any question left about the future success of God's plans. There's no way, no, I mean, Romans 3 says even if every single human being failed, God couldn't fail. So, the ultimate expression of the kingdom of God is still to come. And that expression will be far more glorious than we can even imagine. And a verse that we have been, we've referred to fairly often, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, Paul says, for it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles, like people condemned to die in public as a spectacle for the whole world of angels and of humanity. We are living on the theater, in the theater of God. Um, there's another passage I wanted to put in with that. Let me see if I can. It's found in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Verse 9, who, however, as the scripture says, what no one ever saw or heard, what no one even thought could happen, is the very thing God prepared for those who love him. Ellen White says, higher than the human thought can think. A few minutes God's ago, we were trying to speculate as to what we're going to do for eternity. Yeah, <laughs> right. God has plans for us that are way beyond anything we can possibly imagine. When the disciples finally began to ask questions pointedly about the future of the Jewish nation, Jesus spelled out in considerable detail what would happen before the kingdom of glory would come to this earth. And those are the chapters, Mark 13, Luke 21, Matthew 24 and 25. And it isn't a pretty picture. Remember at that time Jesus said, if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Not, not, none of what we now see occurring in the world around us is a surprise to God. The day of the Lord will only come after God's people pass through a terrible time of trial. Satan will not give up. I mean, here's the point. Satan will never give up his kingdom without a final, ultimate, all-out battle. And what do we call that? Armageddon. Armageddon. In the midst of that battle, we are to be preparing ourselves and others through the proclamation of the gospel. Christians are to have their hopes constantly buoyed up by faith. And how does that work? The hope of Christ's appearing is a large hope, a far-reaching hope. It is the hope of seeing the King in His beauty and of being made like Him. Signs of the Times, January 20, 1895. Even as they were walking from Jericho up to Jerusalem for the final time, Jesus' disciples and the huge crowd were looking forward to the establishment of an earthly kingdom. And even after the resurrection, yeah. as we read in Acts 1. And what did Jesus say to them? He, gave, he told the story about these gold coins. He says, God gives his, his, his riches out. He shares the gospel with you. What are you going to do with the gospel? Are you going to Use the gospel that God has given you. Are you going to share it? 
If they read the passages of Scripture and came to the wrong conclusion, how do we know that when we read the passages of Scripture, we aren't coming to the wrong conclusion? That's a very good question, and the only possible answer is we need to keep reading, we need to keep thinking, we need to compare this passage with that passage. We need to see the whole picture, and we need to ask the Holy Spirit's guidance as we try to understand it. I don't know any other way. Well, to his servants, Christ, and one more passage from Ellen White, Christ's Object Lessons, page 326, paragraph 4. To his servants, Christ commits, quote, his goods, something to be put to use for him. Not more surely is the place prepared for us in the heavenly mansions than is the special place de designed, uh, designated on earth where we are to work for God. Incredible. Are we prepared to be a part of that future kingdom? I don't know if you are interested or whether you have a chance, an opportunity in your own Sabbath school class to raise some of these questions. We think they're thought-provoking questions, and we spent a lot of time trying to put together the materials and so forth, just as the Sabbath school uh, study guide committee has done. If you'd like to share our materials and think about the questions we've raised, you can go to our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, theox dot O-R-G, and you'll find there handouts for every Sabbath school lesson that we, we talk about here and everyone that, that the, 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 the Sabbath school quarterly talks about as well. This is, a, this is a big work, and it's a challenge to each one of us. But the Sabbath school lessons are not just for entertainment for half an hour or an hour on Sabbath morning. These are lessons that are supposed to challenge us to the work which God has placed before us. Are we prepared? I said get ready, right? What do we need to do to get ready? Ask your class when you go. Ask them what they, what they think needs to be done to get ready. What kind of a church would your church be if everyone there had as its top priority getting ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ? I have a feeling things would be a little different than they are now. Think about it. See what you would say. Are you getting ready? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of wrestling with these challenging ideas in Scripture. Forgive us where we may have been a little bit lax, a little bit lethargic. Help us to run the course, as Paul said, to win the race, to finish the course. And may we each have an opportunity to do that, and may it be soon as our prayer in Jesus' name.